All right, just about to get going here. We've got a few people showing up uh, late right now, so we're going to be diving into this. If you are watching live, can you please let me know that you can hear the audio? Drop something in the comments section. Want to say what's up to Scott, uh, Dave Vonia, and a couple other people watching right now. But if somebody could um, drop a comment in the questions right now to let me know you can hear the audio, and we will get rolling here. So um, as we're waiting for a comment here, just to make sure we have audio, we are going to be diving into the talk that um, Chris Volpe and I uh, from Service Autopilot gave at SA6. We had standing room only, and a lot of people wanted to know if there was a recording or if we could basically repurpose this, um, so we didn't have a recording. So what I'm going to do here over the next 50 minutes to an hour is break down um, the step-by-step -step setup of Service Autopilot. We're going to start literally from lead acquisition all the way through billing. Uh, in addition, at the end of the video here, we're going to be talking about uh, a way that you can actually get a hold of our automated video training with testing at pretty much no cost. But um, the main idea here of the video is if you've bought Service Autopilot recently or if you're using it eight or nine years, I want to break down the process for success. So we're going to show you probably the 15 to 20 different places in SA that need to be touched and set up foundationally and how they build on top of each other. And then... Once that's set up, we're going to show you how to condense Service Autopilot down to five or six screens of success and have a system that can be trained and delegated to anybody in your office. Or if you're just getting new to Service Autopilot, you will be able to um, get in there and rock and roll with it. So a uh, little background on myself as you're looking at this here. If you want to get a copy um, of this presentation, a cheat sheet, go to the website SA6 Deep Dive. So it's the URL of SA6 Deep Dive.com. That's going to get you a, um, a PDF of this slideshow. So you have a step by step directions how to actually do this in your business. So um, make sure you do that. Just a little background on myself before we dive into this. So uh, originally, my lawn care company started about 25 years ago, pushing a lawnmower around the neighborhood to get some gas money. Evolved past through college, had several crews while I was in college working full time and going to school, um, and then basically built a business around myself. I was the single point of failure. Um, it eventually caused a divorce in my personal life because I was literally working seven days a week, probably close to 100 hours a week, maybe even more if you included the nights um, behind the computer trying to figure out how to get the different softwares to work. So after kind of hitting rock bottom, um, we figured out that I needed to, or at least I figured out, I needed to figure out a way to use a software such as Service Autopilot and automations um, that we fell into to basically take that um, time back and be able to have a work-life balance. So what I'm going to do is show you in this presentation how to set Service Autopilot up if you want to create that work-life balance and um drive success this spring season. So uh, some of this stuff is going to be brand new, even if you've been using SA for years. So this is going to be uh, not just for the rookie user, but it's going to be for everybody. So I can see from my phone here, I didn't turn the notifications off. Some people are already hitting that SA6DeepDive.com. So that will be available all day today. Um, I opened it back up. So if you're watching this live, you can actually get a copy of these slides as well. So Without any fit, further delay, we're going to dive into this. And if you have any questions, um, unlike the conversation we had several hundred people in the room at SA6, Chris Volpe and I, uh, I can answer these live here over the next hour or so. Um, I've got a call uh, at the top of the hour, but I'm going, to, I'm going to have at least 55 minutes to an hour here to go through slowly, break this down for you sequentially so you can see how to set Service Autopilot up for success here. So, um, And here we go. And I'm going to put in the uh, comments here as well. Uh, there is a link to a live event that we're doing March 9th and 10th, Monday, Tuesday, uh, as well. 16 hours of actual step-by-step -step in more in-depth training of this as well. But the idea is take this roadmap, use it yourself and build success with SA this upcoming season. So without any further delay, we are going to hop into this. So as you're looking at this, a fully set up service autopilot account. I'm going to dive in so you can actually zoom in each part of this. You can see it when I break it down. But as we're looking at service autopilot fully set up, one of the biggest disadvantages, at least in my business that we had is when we first bought service autopilot, we had to rush to set up the actual system for 
Um, we had to rush to set the system up for scheduling and billing. Obviously, we need to get the work done. We needed to get paid. Um, that was a major pain point in the business. So where a lot of us are at a disadvantage when we go to buy a software like Service Autopilot, we have to rush to those videos. But as you can see um, on the screen here, that scheduling and billing here at the end. So we've missed half of the setup, if not three quarters of foundational pieces of the service autopilot setup. Um, and we're going to have some missing gaps. So what we find is most people in service autopilot have a lot of these dots, but they're just not connected. And when they're not connected, that causes a massive, massive issue uh, because all the foundational reporting and things that need to happen aren't building sequentially on top of themselves the way they should. So as we go into this, we're going to drive down to each part of this um, and look at it. So the first thing we're looking at here is when a fully set up system is we need an estimate request. So what we're going to do is go into either your V2 or now V3 forms. Um, we're going to be covering that on Monday and Tuesday as well, V3 forms. Uh, but the idea is your estimate request should be a service autopilot form that we take the stripped code and give it to your webmaster or if you're savvy enough with code. Um, and that should be embedded in your website and style. And the idea is we capture the person's first name, last name, address, and what services they're interested in. And they're going to be automatically entered in the essay with no double entry, and it should trigger a to do or a task for somebody in your office with accountability to get that estimate out within that end of that business day. In addition, we should be tracking the sales source. So this is how they heard about us. So obviously coming off the website, it's a website lead acquisition. Conversely, when a client calls, we need to go in and get certain information into the system from day one for success. So throughout the next 45, 50 minutes, I'm going to show you step by step how to get all these things in for best practice if you follow the simple growth methodology. But we're going to get that client info in and we're also going to go in and talk about sales source. How did they hear about us? So was it a door hanger? Was it a nine around? Was it a Facebook ad? They saw our truck, somebody in their uniform a customer referral, whatever that was, we want to track it in the system for lead source tracking. So website or from the office, we know how they heard about us. Now when we can go in is we can see how many people came from each marketing source, how many of them converted into a client. And if there was a marketing spend, what we spent financially on that lead acquisition. So how much did it cost us to get a lead from each marketing source and uh, statistically how many of those that come in from each marketing source convert into a client. So as we go to scale out the business this year, it's now a math equation. So if you don't have these numbers in the system, it's really advantageous to build them out now. So going into the following season or your next marketing campaign, you have good data and you literally say, if I want to grow by 300 clients, this is statistically the average I need to push across each marketing source how many estimates I'm going to have to do and statistically out of those estimates, how many people are going to convert into clients. And now we also can go into the data and service autopilot once you have enough data and pull out a client lifetime value. So you can say, okay, maybe I have a ad from home advisor, a client, and it costs me say $30 for that client. But maybe the lifetime value for home advisor isn't that great. Maybe it's only worth 250 to $300. But maybe your Facebook client acquisition cost, the cost to get them through marketing is maybe say $100 or $120, but their client lifetime value is between eight and $9,000. So obviously as we're looking to build that mix of clients from each marketing source, we may want to go as a heavier ad spend on Facebook versus HomeAdvisor as an example, because the client lifetime value is significantly larger. There's a better ROI for reoccurring revenue, hopefully on that client. So now that we've got good data in, we've got good data out. So we have our marketing and lead source tracking. At this point, they're entered in service autopilot. Next thing is we're going into an estimate creation process. And the estimate creation process is traditionally where we spend 85 to 90% of our time um, outside of automations as a certified advisor helping people get the system set up. So I'm going to really dive into finer detail in this video of how to actually do this. But on a high level, before we get it, I want to kind of connect these dots you may or may not have. But the estimate creation process is going to be focused on a thing called custom fields. Now, custom fields are these job variables. So depending on the industry, they're going to be different. In lawn care, there are going to be things as turf square footage, linear length of landscape bed to be bed edge, bed square footage, small, medium, and large shrubs, 
Home cleaning is going to be based on the square footage of the home, number of bedrooms or bathrooms, how many pets, how many people living in there. These are the foundational things that we need to tackle. And then we're going to build a price matrices on the back end. Now, the biggest misconception here, and I'm going to break a lot of the misconceptions in this video here, is um, there's basically three ways of estimating when we all start out, at least when I started in my business. And those are significantly growing on top of each other. So the first is we first get in business and we go out and look at a job and we say, okay, well, based on my market, that lawn mowing or that home cleaning is, let's say, a $35 visit or home cleaning, maybe it's $120 visit. That's what the market going rate is that we feel and that's what we charge now obviously that's not the the bright correct way of doing it but when we first start out we really don't know so that's how we dive into this um and the next step is we go in and take a look at it and say okay based on my experience this is how long it should take to mow that lawn or clean that house and if my hourly rate is say fifty dollars per man hour that's the goal to get per technician um and if it's going to take me an hour based on my experience how long i think it's going to take I'm going to charge $50 an hour, so one hour times the $50 an hour revenue goal. That is the next step, um, and usually that evolution. Now, the final step is tracking the square footage of the yard, the square footage of the home, and based on your actual equipment, your guys and girls in the field, we've created a standardized production rate estimating system. So number of units, or I mean hours or minutes, or production rate based on area, units, or length can all be calculated in the back of a price matrices. And that's what's built behind the services now in Service Autopilot with custom fields of these job variables. So if you don't have production rates, it's still very effective to create a price matrices to take the emotion out of it. And then we can track the actual production through a job cost and production report. And we'll get into that later. But the idea is we want to evolve into the system no matter where you're at on that sliding scale of estimate um, complexity. So the next thing is we've got these variables. We go in and hit add an estimate. We're going to select a template. I'm going to break this down in detail throughout this talk. But my idea is that you would want to have a separate template for a lead and a client. Those are two significantly different conversations, in my opinion, based on a person being a lead and a person being a client. Somebody's already worked you do. That's a different marketing conversation. So we really want to dial in and have a conversation based on where they're at in the client life cycle. So once we selected that template, all our services loaded, whether we're basing it on minutes or hours projected on our experience or production rate, we're going in and hit quote on the services we want to select. I'm gonna show you pictures and how we break this down. Um, but the idea is when that template loads for fully set up implementation, we really should have a price, a budgeted time and a cost before profit. So we know what our projected time and profit is on that job and we just hit quotes. And so now it's a delegatable system. Once that's ready to go, we create that estimate and hit save. We're going to probably try to close them over the phone or live in person. That's going to be the best practice. Um, but if we can't close them in person over the phone, we're going to go out and email that estimate. And we're going to have a pre-templated email that loads and we can tweak and send it. But the idea is it's a pre-built marketing document based on a leader or client that we standardize our marketing conversation. It's a set it and forget it situation that can be delegated that does not revolve around you, the business owner, for success at any point in the system. The gentleman that ran Callahan's lawn care for several years had never trimmed a bush, mowed a lawn, mulched beds, or done any of the things outside of fertilization. Within three to five days, maybe a week, this gentleman was estimating with pennies on the dollar to my estimates that I was doing with 25 years plus experience. So this can be done in a systematic, predictable way. But in order to do that, we've got to have these custom fields and variables, a production rate system uh, based on area or units of length. And if you're not ready for that, we have it based on minutes or hours, based on the estimator's experience, and then we evolve three to six months into that. So you're in a prime position right now if you're watching this to set this up for success if you're not there and evolve into the process of the software. So now that we've created the the lead off the estimate or, or off the website of them calling. We've entered them into SA. We've captured these custom variables based on the job, whether it's time or units. Uh, we add an estimate. We select the template. We quote the services with a price, budget, and time, and cost before profit. If we don't close them in person, we've emailed this now pre-templated marketing document. The next workflow is if we lose the estimate, there should be a set process. If we win the estimate, there should be a set process for success that can be delegated and documented for predictable systems in the business. 
The first thing is if we lose the SMA. Obviously, this is not the predictive, this is not the preferred workflow, but it does happen. And there's two ways this happens. Is if the person physically says, yes, I am not hiring you, or maybe it goes past 20 days. In our 20 days to close process, we find between 20 and 21 days is probably the proper point to close out that estimate after the last reach out and mark that estimate loss. And then we're gonna drive them into a long-term nurture to educate and upsell the service later. But the idea is when we lose an estimate in SA, it should be marked as loss on a specific service. And then we go in to uh, the upper right-hand corner, hit that tab and we close out the lead. So now we've got a very clean picture of how many people are in the system as leads that can convert into clients and how many people have passed that threshold of say 20 days or physically said no. Database hygiene here, it's not sexy, but it is sexy when you see the numbers because now you can go into your system and filter down how many people do I have actively in a sales pipeline that can convert into a client, how many people are passed and are in that long-term nurture that we're educating and systematically upselling later. So the next thing here is if we win the estimate, we need to go in and either physically mark the services one if we're on the phone or in person, or if they're on the online estimate, the customer is checking physically on the estimate and accepting and hopefully signing electronically to accept that. They're going to get an automated email right back, letting them know that we've acknowledged the acceptance of that actual um, estimate, and there's a notification coming inside in the software. It should be assigned to a specific role or person that's responsible for scheduling that work, and that's how we set that up. In our, in our automated process. And I'm gonna show you how that works a little bit later in the talk here. But the idea is we've won this estimate, we've marked the services and we're gonna hit schedule. Um, but what's gonna happen is you need to convert that client into, or that lead into a client. So the system by scheduling off the estimate is what we're recommending is gonna set you up for success because it's gonna force you to convert the lead into a client. So now you have database hygiene, Mrs. Smith, who was once a lead, cannot be a lead and a client at the same time. You have a clean database and a clear look at what's going on. It's also going to help your stats for lead conversion in sales one into a client. So the database that's searching those reports is going to be looking for some of these triggers and switches on the actual lead to client conversion. So once we come off the estimate, the other major benefit is most people will be grabbing a pen and paper and writing down the service, the price, hopefully a budgeted time. When we schedule from the estimate, we are able to take the price, the budget of time and cost before profit, any products or materials and job costing along that, and they will automatically be transferred over to the physical job itself. And that is um, one of the major, major benefits of as scheduling from the estimate to the job. So that's gonna be the preferred workflow. Now there is a few instances in cleaning, um, Predominantly, that, that this may not work, but you may want to, uh, what you're gonna do is convert that lead into a client and then schedule directly off that off the estimate. But you, 99% of the situations, you're gonna schedule directly off the estimate. Now, the next thing is, once we've won that estimate, we're gonna schedule the work. There's several different types of scheduling we're going to go over and recommend. They include one-time jobs, so you know the day of the job. Reoccurring jobs, your weekly, bi-weekly or custom say every three week jobs. And then we have a thing called waiting. List. So maybe we're going into the spring season, we have a spring cleanup. Spring cleanup needs to be done maybe sometime this month, but it doesn't need to be done today. So it's gonna give you the ability to pull off a waiting list and schedule within predefined dates to build optimization and minimize your non-billable drive time. In addition, fertilizing or package jobs are gonna hit the same methodology. Maybe your first application of fertilizers from April 1st through April 30th for pre-emergent, it's going to allow you to schedule for optimization and plug maybe your callbacks in there for post-emergent. So once we have that, we're gonna double check the price and budgeted hours. Beautiful part is if you're following this workflow, it is already set up for success because it has already been transferred from the estimate. So once again, we're eliminating steps and standardizing that workflow. Next thing is we're going into routing. So there's three different main types of routing that we're going to recommend. We'll hit on the fourth as well and tell you why we don't necessarily recommend it. Uh, the first one is your free optimization, under 23 visits, uh, and it's taken care of right through Google integration in SA, and it will optimize the stop. 23 or more uh, would be a paid optimization through Maps Pro, works excellent. We do recommend that as well. And then the third is manual. So whether you're doing the free or paid optimization, we're gonna optimize it, 
And then we'll use the manual process to drag and drop a tweak, looking at the sequential order on the um, map. So we have sequentially one, stop one, two, three, and four, five, and so on. And we're gonna make sure that makes sense in our market because we know our market the best, but 99% of the time, that routing is pretty much spot on. We're gonna show you if your mapping is not spot on, how to fix that in the next few slides. Final part of routing is um, basically called grouping. And grouping basically groups your jobs for latitude and longitude. It doesn't take into account for bodies of water, major highways, or anything else in between. It works as advertised, but far as best practice, we don't recommend really using that to optimize your workflow and drive time for that. So the next thing is we're going in and we've got these jobs now on the dispatch board. We've got them in the order and any reoccurring schedules we're saving for our weekly or biweekly. So they're coming up um, in the same exact order. We can pull or move them on the fly uh, as we see fit. So the next thing is we want to adjust the crew members on the fly. So under the more tab, we can adjust the crews. This is really, really important because if we don't have the right crew members on the job and just a quick drag and drop, it's going to affect your budget of time your job costing, production rates, and if you're doing hourly jobs, time and material, it will also affect that. So good data in, good data out. Every morning we need to adjust those crews, whether it's on the dispatch board or in the mobile to make sure they're accurate. Um, this can also be done in the new team app. We're gonna select all the jobs and now dispatch and either print or get them out on the mobile. I'm recommending the mobile, but there are some companies that still use the print and that is a process that we'll go through and I'll show you how that should be set up for success. Now the guys and girls are out actually out in the field doing the work. So once the work is done or as it's being finished, this closeout day screen here is probably the most important screen in the whole entire system. And why it's the most important system is um, part of the system is, is because it's the last part a human can actually physically touch the screen and adjust your payroll, your job costs, your production rates, and most importantly, your invoices. So whether you're invoicing daily, weekly, or monthly, the system is going to trigger those invoices, as you probably well know, at basically midnight or 12.01. So those are automatically generated. So this is going to be a quick two to three minute step we're going to walk, walk through later in the talk today, how to have a sanity check for each crew to make sure we have good data in and good data out. So when those invoices go out, we know we have good data. When we're doing job costing, production rates. In those reports, we're confident in the data. There's nothing worse than sitting down with an SA member and they assume they have really good data in there, but when we go to do the report, we have hours of data cleanup because they haven't taken them one or two minutes per crew each day to double check this. And then the other benefits of, it, of that is you can give real-time feedback to your crews as well as financially for yourself. So now once that's done, invoice and collection. Now most people have this buttoned out, but there really is a three-click stop to charge all your cards, email the invoices, and print the invoices. The other big thing that we like to train on is prepayments, how to put those in. In addition, the biggest mistake that we see in the system is people doing installment billing, so contracts. Um, what we really need to do is set up a contract. We need to put all the services underneath it. We need to set up the obvious installment amount, but the and you can track the overages for amount of trips or hours as well to bill or have alerts. Um, but the idea is once we have that installment and we need to go out and schedule these jobs uh, for success for reporting. This is where 99% of the people that come to a simple growth deep dive that we work with remotely do not have these dots connected. Uh, each job, let's say we have lawn mowing underneath a contract or weekly cleaning under a, an installment contract on a commercial set. You need to have the actual job, the price, and the budgeted time. And then you need to associate with the contract so they don't bill out separately. Um, but they will not bill out if they're attached to the contract. But if you don't have a price, a budget, a time uh, on each job that's associated underneath the contract, you have no data in, so you have absolutely no data out. So that is a key to success when setting this up. So hopefully that makes sense. Now we're actually going to dive into the nitty-gritty to actually show you step-by-step -step sequentially how SA really needs to be set up for success. So custom fields. Uh, we alluded to that earlier when we were talking about the pricing matrix. These are these job variables. Uh, they can be done in area, units, length, or time. That's how we can evolve into this. So on the left here, I've got cleaning industry examples. So number of small, medium, and, be small, medium and large be uh, bedrooms and with job notes. Those can be custom fields. So not only can they be for um, the actual estimate itself, but it can be gate codes, different notes to your team. So all that knowledge silo now is automatically put onto the work order and on the mobile. In snow removal, we can go in based on 
number of um, inches of snow and different production rates. And then in lawn care, pest control, turf square footage, different production rates for different size of mowers, bed square footage, number of small, medium, and large shrubs. These are all different things, including maybe mulch load time or drive time or delivery. These are all the things that we miss, but by breaking out the custom field first, we're setting ourselves up. So the first thing we want to do is define our custom field, probably with some naming, standardized naming convention. And then we're going to go in and actually uh, create the services. So the idea is before you go and build the services and essay, we need to have a blueprint. And I use the analogy of building a house. We don't build a house without a blueprint. We're not putting random doors, windows, and everything uh, in, in the house without a blueprint. We follow the blueprint. Well, the idea of blueprinting and implementing all at once in Service Autopilot is where all the mistakes happen. Um, and a lot of times people are uh, noticing the data entry error or checking their math. Um, but we have a, a, a lawn care and cleaning example. But for lawn mowing square footage from one to 5,000 square feet is $45. That's our base price to show up. And for one person, we're going to say it's going to take 20 minutes, 0.33 man hours. And based on our hourly cost and our expense per man hour net profit, fictitiously in this pricing, we're making $11.88 profit on our base price. And we've double checked our profit and profit percentage. So now we've got a blueprint that confirms our pricing structure, and then we take this, and these five lines are going to line up identically to SA. So we have a blueprint how to build the matrix in SA. I'm going to show you that on the next screen. We're also looking at every thousand over a five thousand base price is an additional two dollars and seventy five cents, point oh five hours, and a dollar eighty cost before profit. And these are based on our actual numbers that we're trying to get this season. Our goal is $55 per man hour, and it's costing us $36 per even. This is going to give you a blueprint for success for delegating estimates that are going to be right each and every time. Now, in our cleaning example, we have our weekly cleaning base price up to 1,200 square feet, $145 for the cleaning base price, 2.9 made hours, and a break even of $101.50 based on the projected dollar per made hour here and the cost per made hour. And then we have an additional cost for every 500 or 1200. So no matter the industry, this can be built out in a systematic, predictable way. Once we've blueprinted it, it's time to actually go out and take your blueprint and implement. It. So what we're going to do is go in and actually take um, the back end of your rate matrix. Now we've gone in and created a calculation, quantity rate times visits, and we're basing it on the custom fields. The blueprint is your guide to success. So I've got the service of lawn mowing, turf square footage is the custom field. And we've gone in and taken the top line here right from our blueprint, the page before, right here. And this screenshot of it here is literally lines up identical to the top five lines. So all we're doing is transferring our numbers from the blueprint into SA. We don't want to blueprint and implement all on the same page. That would be blimplementing. Blimplementing is not good. We want a blueprint and then implement. And now you have a roadmap or a blueprint each and every year you go to raise your prices or your costs go up to what actually has to be updated in SA. So now the business owner isn't tied to this tedious task. This is something that can be delegated to an office member if they could simply transfer and match up these five cells. So that's the success of delegation and predictability in the estimating system. So hopefully that makes sense. But we're going to blueprint and implement, and our blueprint is going to line up identical to what's going on here. So the first thing, as we saw in that flow chart, is the entry is from a lead acquisition standpoint from the website or the office. So this is how we're tackling the website estimate request with no double entry. So when they hit the estimate request on the website, it should be automatically entered in the service autopilot with no double entry. This is a V2 form, but the functionality of a V3 form that we're going to be covering on our two-day, 16-hour event um, live March 9th and 10th, this upcoming Monday, um, and I'm going to put up the sign-up link on the other side or so you can check it out um, there. But this is going to be what, some of the stuff we're going over here in V3 forms now. But the idea is, no matter if it's V2 or V3, the functionality is very similar, almost identical, really. And they just look different. We're going to break down the understanding of that. But the idea is um, we're going to go in, and the first name, last name needs to be mapped back to update and create a lead, and it needs to be mapped back to those fields. Same thing in V3. 
service address needs to be mapped back to, or address needs to be mapped back to service address. Phone number needs to be mapped back and as well as email. So whether you're creating a lead or a client, the foundational pieces of the scene, we need to be mapped back to create that lead. We're gonna auto populate on submit. So once they hit the website, they're automatically entered. New V3 forms have amazing duplicate checking. So we're gonna go over that as well next week. Um, and then we're gonna grab the information based on what services they want in the lawn care example, or we're gonna go in in the cleaning example and grab some of those variables as well of different things we need to base our estimate on. The idea is they hit the website, they're automatically entered, that triggers a to-do or a task for somebody to contact them within that business day. And then there's a confirmation email going out acknowledging that we have accepted or we have received that estimate request. And then through some automation process, hopefully we're going to start to nurture them and build a higher perceived value before we get them the price and address any sales or price objections. So the next thing is once we have that, we've captured them off the website, we've tracked that they've come from the website. Um, the next thing is potentially they're calling our office. We're picking up the phone. So what we're going to do is go in and hit the green icon here and add a lead. We're going to put first name, last name. If it's a commercial client, it would go here. As we enter in the service address information, it will automatically populate into the billing area. So there's no double entry. It's a systematic in here, copies over the billing, but you can't override the billing if it's different. Contact information, a bare minimum, steps of success for delegation. We want to get an email. We want to get a cell phone number. When in doubt, always put the cell phone, the number, phone number in the cell phone figure. Because that field is going to be able to tie into your automations and additional features of SA's building on V3 future um, things. Cell phone providers legacy, ignore it. You do not need it with two-way texting right now. If it's a property manager, somebody that owns multiple properties, you would assign the actual master property to this. So we did all the Walgreens and Rite Aids in the city for a while. We had one property management company, so they were the master property to all the subsequent Rite Aids. Next tab, as we go in is details. We wanna fill this out, count tight. We need to select residential and commercial, in my opinion, for best practice. Reason being is this is going to allow us to segment our database for reporting as well as automations to have relevant conversations through an automated process based on them being commercial or residential. A lot of people are going out and spraying email blasts and saying to the fact, um, like an example is, um, it's time to re-sign up for this service. If you already signed up, ignore this. That is not the right practice, but by taking these little sequential steps and being able to segment your database, have that database hygiene. This is where it's sexy because now we can have automated but personal conversations based on the type of client or where they're at in the customer life cycle. This is where automations are beautiful because they're automated, but they look personable and meaningful to where they're at in the customer life cycle. So under details, commercial or residential, under sales, we want to go in and track the sales source. How did they hear about it? So we hit that button, it drops it down, and we're tracking the sales source. Now we know how many people have come from the website and converted into a client, how many people came from each marketing source, converted into a client, and if it was a marketing spend, the cost per acquired client, and then eventually we have a lifetime value per lead source. All the foundational pieces that need to build up for success. Next part is the visual clues around service autopilot. So as we're training somebody fresh off the street or we're training somebody that maybe hasn't really been properly trained in the system, I want to get you down to five to six screens of success. So there's visual clues that we train to. First of it is on a lead, this long gray bar here, add an estimate. That is going to be the first visual clue that that is a lead. When they become a client, there's three distinct columns for jobs, accounting, and estimates and contracts in there. That's a visual clue. When you're up here in the search bar, this little person here, the avatar with the red L is a lead. If you look to the left of the screen, I've got the avatar with the red L is a lead. When we close out that lead, they go past 20 days or they lose an estimate. We're going to go and close them out under this more tab over here. And when you do that, it, there's nothing there. There is no avatar. So you can go in and automatically see, are they a lead? Are they a lead that's been closed out? The avatar here with nothing next to it, just the black avatar, is a client. So, okay, this person's a client. Or if they've canceled our service, it's the little black avatar with a slash through. So those are the visual clues that we need to, in my opinion, be training ourselves and our staff to. Because we're going to systemize it and make it a seamless workflow in the software system by doing this. Now, 
as we're going in, workflow for estimate data collection. So we're going to recommend you use Maps Pro. Have a standard phone intake sheet for standardized questioning and information that needs to get in that doesn't need to be babysat by you, or the manager, or the owner, and an on-site estimate form. We're going to break down the workflow. So the first thing we're going into is Maps Pro. And Maps Pro is going in to take the property measurements. It's going to capture your custom field, so linear length of stick edging, square footage of turf. And then we're going to create a saved view. So under the More tab, we have property measurements here, and that's right here. And we're going to go to the satellite view. But we've measured out the turf area right here for 90,000 square feet. We've clicked on this green and hit Save. We've done the bed square footage in purple, and it's safe. So every time we pull this client up or leak up the office, and now the field staff, if we take a screenshot and upload it into um, attachments, we have clear knowledge of what's being serviced and not being serviced, and hopefully some notes. And now what's in your head as a business owner is delegated to your office and the field staff. So we want to just disseminate that knowledge uh, and make it open. And this is a great way of doing it. Cool thing is here with a plus sign is the zero and the negative, uh, we can add or subtract or hold a null value. And what we're going to do is assign a custom field here and assign the custom field and save it. So now the turf square footage, the bed square footage, uh, maybe the snow plow area are all saved. So every time we pull this client up, we can do a live estimate based on the property specific pricing. That is the advantage of Maps Pro. Uh, we used to use a free product called findlotsize.com. What we found is our workflow is saved between 25 and about 40% uh, by using this internally. And then I'm not sure the savings, but I'm sure there definitely was because all the knowledge of what we measured each time was there and we could refer to it. So highly recommend property measurements through Maps Pro. Then the A for auto assist. We go in and grab um, our, our new phone intake sheet. And basically what this is, it's a standardized form that we need to grab all the information. So as you train your staff, your virtual assistant, these are the questions we need to ask each and every time. Um, this is an example from Debbie Sardone's um, model for cleaning industry. And she, she's a mover and shaker. And Debbie and I, are, I've got a big announcement coming up for the cleaning industry here for a, um, a, a CBF version of Service Autopilot completely built out. But I want to kind of give you a peek onto the hood of how you can build this out, but everything that's already in there, first name, last name, already populates in live in the system. So there's no double entry, but we're going to go in and ask certain questions. How did you hear about this? What type of service? Um, square footage of the home or maybe square footage of the turf, whatever that is in the, the, home, the home cleaning industry or the, the lawn care industry. But we want to ask these questions. And when we enter these, they're saved as custom fields. So whether we measure it online or in person, we're capturing this information. Um, here's another example of it for lawn care. So all the information pulls up. We're walking around with our mobile, clicking in all the information. So lawn square footage, bed square footage, number of small, medium, large shrubs. We're including an area down here at the bottom. Um, I'll pull that up so you can see it. Is we've typed in and said, does not include hedgerow on the back west lot line. So as you're going around and making notes on an estimate pad and forgetting to write these things in, instead of writing it down, enter it into the form, and it's going to populate automatically right here on the actual estimate description. So we're eliminating an extra workflow step. So whether it's lawn care over here or cleaning industry here, um, on-site estimate form for cleaning, we're going in to tackle how many hours do you think based on your experience at top to bottom deluxes, weekly, bi-weekly, so on. And when we pull up that estimate, whether it's data from the map or the on-site estimate form, it's automatically gonna populate the price, the budget, time, and cost before profit based on your numbers. And if you have materials, it will suck that in as well. But this is the idea. We're measuring online. We'll create a standardized form to take it while we're in the field or a phone intake sheet to standardize the process and delegate. This is how we took Paul at my company with no experience in certain things. He was estimating as the same as I was within probably a week, if not even less than that. So that's the secret to success, in my opinion, for delegatable, predictable turnkey business. Next thing is pre-built estimate templates. So we're just taking you through that flow chart at the beginning of the call. So we have our leads and clients templates. And that's going to load in with all your services. And when you have square footage, uh, length, number of units, minutes, hours, it automatically cuts as a price, budget, and time and cost. But by pulling this in, it's going to connect the estimate email, the estimate document, and the acceptance email 
with separate marketing text based on where they're at in the customer life cycle. So we're gonna have a personalized but standardized marketing conversation based on a lead or a client. Because those are two significantly different conversations. The next thing is these pre-built estimate templates for lawn care. Here's an example. So we've got our lawn mower, and underneath it we have different drive time areas. So we plug in a variable that calculates the average drive time price, cost, and time. But all the consumer sees is um, one price. But now we have a, a on-site and a mobilization overhead recovery. Uh, if you have things like disposal, those can be defaulted in there. So if we have uh, disposal fee of thirty dollars for debris on spring cleanups. These can be automatically defaulted in. So when your estimator forgets or sharpens their pencil, this is now eliminated. So we created a standardized process all the way through here with pre-templated uh, templates that load price, budget, time, and cost, and standardized marketing documents based on where they're at. The customer life cycle also standardized and somewhat automated. So uh, the next thing is as we're diving into this, we have. Uh, cleaning estimates. So we don't want to forget about our cleaning friends. We have different ways of doing this, but this is also very applicable to lawn care. We have estimates with price ranges. So we have high and low price ranges. So the we the in the cleaning example is a top to bottom clean between nine and eleven made hours of three sixty to four forty. But this can also be done for spring or fall cleanup. Maybe you don't want to quote an exact just hourly price T and M, but if you know based on square footage, it's going to be between nine and eleven hours you can give a high low price range. So this gives you the ability to sell a lot more of these gateway services over the phone. And then once you get on site and you prove yourself, you upsell with higher reoccurring services. But the idea is speed and simplicity for predictable profits and delegation. Uh, estimates with exact price as well. So we've got estimates price range, high and low, and then we have some with exact price. So it's gonna give you that granularity no matter your industry to either do exact price or high low ranges for things that may have some variability. And that first time cleaning for uh, the top to bottom deluxe or deep cleaning cleaning or a spring or fall cleanup are the services that are gonna have that variability, let's be honest about it. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to go out and lock up all your spring or fall cleanups in the lawn care industry without physically having to go to that estimate and say, you know what, based on your square footage, we've got you between nine and 11 hours. If it goes outside of that, there's an hourly charge, but that's where you're probably gonna be based on your square footage. It takes a lot of the risk out of it. Close them over the phone before your competitors actually go there and do the estimate person. Next thing is pre-built estimate email. So we've, we've captured it online or the intake from the office or on site. That information is dove into a template. And we've quoted all the services. Now when we go to email that estimate, this pre-templated email for leads and clients. There's a couple things we want here. All the information to and from loads automatically. The email document itself here automatically loads with the pre-built content. And there's a click to view my proposal. So on your end, you're going to see it this year, and there's a merge field. After you send it, the client sees this with a clickable view. And a pro tip that I highly recommend is uh, blank carbon copy yourself, the estimate, and then copy and paste the verbiage and the actual link to the estimate and text message it out to the consumer or send it out through Facebook Messenger. So if they came in through text, we wanna close them through text. So if they came in through Messenger, we wanna close them through Messenger. So we can repurpose this SA estimate on text messaging and, and, and Messenger as well. Huge, huge um, thing. And I will tell you, we're sell, selling 25 to $5,000 jobs through text messaging right now just by that simple hack. Um, and it works really well. So I highly, highly recommend um, that's the case. Um, any of the questions here with David and a few of the other people, uh, we'll be answering it at the end as well. Um, so the next thing is pre-built estimate documents and price grids. So when they see this estimate, we've got very simplistic here in a boilerplate example. Step one, this is the estimate. Select the services you want. Step two is accept and sign. We have a checkbox. It can be pre-selected or non-selected. I recommend probably not selected. So the consumer is physically checking it. Uh, we can assume, include service details and service terms in here as a proof of concept. I highly recommend putting most of that in underneath the actual price grid for simplicity. Uh, we can do videos with estimate and written text. This is something we've been doing at Callahan's Lawn Care in SA probably for the last four to five years at least. We've had videos embedded in our estimates. And I highly recommend it. And what we're going to talk about is what's included in the estimate, what's not included in the estimate, 
in overcoming a sales or price objections up front. So this is your virtual salesperson. So as you, the business owner, evolve past the estimating process, you can still have a massive influence and effect by literally being an evergreen process that runs forever in your estimate. Um, we've got those special job notes. So if this example from the on-site estimate form we typed in does not include hedgerow on the, lot, the west lot line, that would automatically merge in here. So the idea is we've created a template process with standardization and value. Uh, a lot of people are going out there and want to make their estimates look so simplistic. There's no value to them. Um, and, and by putting cute little emojis and things in there, um, yes, you want to make them visually appealing, but you also want to address what's included, not included, and overcome any of the sales or price objections. The idea is to shorten the sales cycle and create such a high perceived value that you can sell for a higher price than your competitors and close those sales. By not putting enough information in here, you are inevitably forcing the consumer to call you or search for your competitor that's giving them the information up front. Don't make that mistake. We made it in the past. Um, so yes, we want it streamlined. We want it to look good, but functionality is the most important thing in my opinion because you need to have these key things in here to sell 24 seven without you, the business owner, being a slave to the business. Final thing is when they go down and accept proposal, we have an electronic signature capture and that's going to be saved right in the system. So we have a time and IT our IP address, time and date stamp, and this signature with the actual PDF printout, all available in SA at no extra cost. So they've taken the functionality of the document sign and stuck it in SA at no extra cost. Next thing is foundationals to scheduling teams. So a lot of people say that SA's routing or Google's routing doesn't work appropriately. It actually works really well. The biggest issue that we find when we're training people how to use this is People haven't taken the time or they're unaware of under team details, that's your team right here, we need a starting address. And based on that starting address, that's where it's going to route. If you are running solo technicians or solo cleaners or even in lawn care, solo fertilizing techs, I highly recommend creating a cleaning team or fertilizing team and have that start where it actually starts on the um, at your shop. Because if you run it off the actual individual the solo technician's um, account or name, if their address for their house is there, the optimization will default to optimize based on the location of their house. So set it and forget it. Create standardization. Don't build processes around your specific employees. Set the teams up and plug your employees in. There. Very similar when we're hiring. We want to create the position for the position, not the position around the individual. So I think at one point you are setting yourself up for failure if you're routing off the individual employee. Set the team up and plug them in as a crew member so you can swap them in and out if they leave or uh, we have a no-call, no-show. Then we know the routing is appropriate based on the starting address of the team and not the employee record. That's a big issue there. I'm going to do that right under add team. Next thing is foundations for scheduling reporting. This is another major area in service autopilot that most people miss. Candidly, I did in the early years as well. I was unaware of it. But under Teams Employees, we go to Edit, and the third tab over is Payroll Job Costing. We need to set up their compensation type. If it's hourly at 15 bucks an hour, what we need to do is under Costing Information, this is hourly rate and hourly overtime rate is with labor and labor burden. So labor burden, and if you haven't... Um, done it already there is a free website sa6 deep dive once again sa6 deep dive.com if you go to that website we'll give you a slide this whole slide deck free of charge um you can use this as a benchmark how to actually set this up but labor burden is going to take your fight on employment comp liability all that information and get it as a percentage of the dollar so in this example it's 19 percent so 19 cents on the dollar so the hour rate is 15 hourly rate with burden is 1785 and OT rate with burden is 2675. These two numbers are the numbers that go here. So even if you're not running payroll, your job costing and different reports are driving information out of this cell. So that needs to be set up for success. Once again, no data in, no data out, or bad data in, bad data out. Traditionally, we see this without labor burden. That We need to have that with labor and labor burden. So sa6deepdive.com, Click that website and we can download these slides here for the next 24 hours as well. So next thing is we're going in and dispatch board. So we want to adjust the teams. 
So under the more tab, we assign teams. So your default teams are set up. That's why we want to go into teams and set them up. But if we have a, 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 an employee that's no call, no show, or we need to create a two person team that becomes a three person team. We're just going to drag and drop them on and off. And then the visual clues is the blue is a team leader and the other one is a technician or employee. So we have some visual clues there. We always want to make sure update uh, right here where the cursor is once that pops off update based on budgeted hours and time. That is going to be um, crucial because as you update those, that's going to update the system real time. So those are the, the foundational parts of setting up your teams and your employees for success. Next thing is a closeout day screen. So as we're driving that flow chart, kind of bringing it home here in the next 10 minutes, um, you really, really want to have this screen set up appropriately. This is the this most important screen in the whole entire system. So under columns here, we can customize the view. So I'm going to suggest that you add in the variance in actual man hours in there. And then your sanity check for two to three minutes a day per crew is at the end of the day or the beginning of the next day before the crews go out so we can address these issues up there. We want to make sure the start time and the stop time makes sense so they're not a minute between because traditionally what happens is the crew will run up, forget to clock in, they clock in and clock out at the end of the job to get to the next job, and it looks like you made probably $1,000 an hour. So, A, that screws up produ production. If you're paying on piece rate or production rate, it screws up your payroll. And what it does is it really jacks up your job costing. And worst of all, if it's a time and materials job, an hourly job, if you don't catch it, you could have a couple hundred dollar, hundred dollar an hour, a couple hundred dollar job, maybe three to four hundred dollars worth of a job that you don't catch because they clock in and out in a minute. You're only charging pennies on the dollar. A lot of the consumers aren't going to be honest and tell you like, hey, I probably owe you three, four hundred bucks. But you've only billed me out for a minute times three hours. So it's very important. Two to three minutes each day. Go to that closeout day screen, top to bottom, hopefully at the end of the day, if not the beginning of the next day before the crew's there because we wait till Friday. The crews aren't going to remember, and you're not going to remember what actually happens. We address it, so we have good data in, good data out. Now, midnight, 1201, daily, weekly, or monthly, these invoices automatically generate. So we want to go in and be able to in invoice the email with a credit card payment option or the client portal. Um, so you can go in and use this invoice uh, here where they click to pay, PCI compliant credit card form, they put their information, and they can um, pay online. Or the additional premium feature is the payment portal. So you can have a merge in with a temporary username and login for that payment portal on a monthly basis. Um, simplicity wise, that PCI compliant form is great because if they're not comfortable giving you a credit card, they can enter it every month and update that card. So two different options. Um, either way works great. This option seems to be getting a little more traction for what we've seen if we don't require a credit card on file from day one. So. As we bring it in here, the last five or six minutes, what are the areas in my business that can be automated now that I have the foundational parts of Service Autopilot set up? They are marketing, sales, fulfillment, finance, and internal slash HR. So the biggest area that we find in the sales automation from stem to stern as a very high over level is we've talked about the estimate request. They hit the estimate request, they're automatically entered in the SA, or they've come from the office. Once they're automatically entered in the SA, our automation process here is going to automatically send out a thing called a lead letter. These are five or six main reasons why our business is different and why they want to do work with us. In addition, we usually tie into a product called SendGin and trigger a hard copy letter of this lead letter with an envelope that looks hand addressed. We have the automated email plus a personalized physical thing they can touch before the estimate. Based on the service they're interested in, we have a personal but automated conversation around their specific interest. So if they're interested in lawn mowing, we're gonna educate them how to do the service themselves as a professional and overcome any sales or price objections such as, do I need to be home to have the service done? Are we gonna close the fence gate behind you because I'm worried about the kids and the dog running out if I don't check it after I leave. So we shorten the sales cycle through education, create a higher perceived value. Once we submit that estimate, if we don't close them over the phone or in person, this is 20 days to close right here. This process kicks in. We have automated estimate of how it be automated email, automated text, and phone calls. Phone calls come in the form of a to-do with a call script. And at the bottom, it says, if they become a client, do this in essay. If they don't become a client, do this in essay. So we've created a standardization to reinforce what we've just talked about. In addition, if you don't want to make phone calls, we tie in Send Jim again here and do a ringless voicemail about it. It hits the cell phone on file without ringing, it leaves a pre-recorded message, and it'll be something to be effective. Hey, it's Mike from Callahan. So sorry I missed you. I wanted to leave this voicemail. Um, 
follow up on the estimate we dropped off three days ago. If you have any questions, call us back at this number or accept the online estimate. We're creating predictable but personalized automated follow-up. Next process, if we win automatically now, all the rest of this happens without a single person to manage or create predictable systems. So it's all automated. We fire off a welcome email automating welcome to the company with a PCI compliant credit card form to get the credit card on file. We do a 30, 60, and 90 day follow up for all reoccurring services, a one time follow up for just one time. Happy holidays, all your major US holidays. We educate them around the holiday and wish them a happy holiday. Monthly newsletters are going out to everybody in the system. And leads and clients, we're going to educate them what they should be doing in their yard or home the month in advance. A big one this winter was ornamental pruning, proper timing, proper cuts. And by the way, we're here to help if you need it. A soft, one time uh, upsell through education. Second thing is mid month, we go out and segment our leads and clients, two separate pipelines of communication. We can run separate promotions for our leads and customers. So we're not alienating our clients, but we could be giving maybe a 10% off your first visit if you sign up before, say, February 1st. Commu different communications or tips based on where they're at in the customer life cycle. Once again, the biggest mistake you see is when people try to automate their business, they spray it across and assume it's applicable to everybody. By having meaningful conversations, you will gain more trust. They will know, like, and trust you and have better communications. Final part is we go in and usually take about five services and we upsell systematically throughout the year. So based on this net going in, if they don't have it scheduled or they haven't signed up for it, we go out and upsell that service. So a big one this fall was aeration and overseeing. We'd go out and upsell that across the database. If you were on the Facebook group right before SA6 conference, you saw people going in and saying, we just got 60 or 80 estimates. Literally in a matter of three to four hours, this was that systematic upsell process. So we're going in and grabbing gateway services and systematically upselling to create a higher lifetime value to reoccurring services. So what usually happens in the spring when we get too busy, uh, relying on people never happens when it should. The automation now takes it from lead acquisition conversion to a welcome and wow and then upsell process as well. Final part here is we dive in. We've got so many employees that we don't know what to do. We've got to get this work done. What we do is automate our employee recruiting, training, and onboarding systems. So whether they come online from Craigslist, Facebook, Indeed, or the office, we take them through English or Spanish in the SA, an online application process, a automated trigger to send, have somebody in the office take the um, call, let's just say Joe, the applicant, interview date time into the automation. The automation reminds them via text one week and one day before. We can assign homework, like get a DMV driver's abstract. We have a standardized interviewing package that allows us to stack that virtual bench that John Petoshnik and I talk about a lot of these regional events. Um, the automation is going to prompt you to put each employee in an A, B, or C fashion, and it give you a saved database in there. So you can go and say, I want all my A applicants from the last 20 days. Now we have a glorified hiring checklist for labor pool. It avoids hiring that first person to throw the pulse with the pulse. So we have a qualified labor pool. If you're not looking for the person you need in the future, it's too late when you need them. So this is going to create that virtual bench process. We hire them, we drop them into a two to three part introduction to company culture, mission, vision, values, that culture alignment for a millennium employee. Instead of seven to eight months out of person, we're seeing three to five years. It's going to take that bench and extend it. Automated tax document collections. All the things that need to happen, happen now automatically. So we're going to buy time back online before they get to you. After we hire them, before we train them, we buy time back and test them and make sure they can follow super direction deadline. Final part here is now we go in and train them. We take the six steps um, of modules of video training with testing over 36 videos, following the original flow chart of getting someone up and running with SA. And then... Uh, once they're in there, we're good to go. So we can either retrain our office staff or we can bring new office staff in. In addition, we went out and created video training for the field staff. So we had online automated video training series for everyone in the business. We created our own little franchise without franchise fees, basically. So whether you're working with us or doing it yourself, this is the ideal model, in my opinion. So we've got office training with automations and we have video training um, there. Next thing is we track employment handbook and contract fulfillment. So originally the business would require the manager owner to be there every time we had a new hire. Now the automation delegates it and creates a predictable process for somebody to track it. So what should happen, happens each and every time without the business owner. Final slide of the day, and I'm gonna answer your live questions here for the last 10 minutes as well. Final part is we've got a sales system. We've got an employee system now. Now you've got 20 or 30 employees 
And now the business owner comes in and they're basically running a full-time daycare. Um, this is my journey right here to becoming an absentee owner. This is the final piece. In inside service autopilot, there's seven core areas of the business that can be automated. There's sales, customer service, scheduling, billing, office manager, maintenance owner. And what we did is we took what's inside the business owner's head or manager's head and we delegated and automated. So on a weekly, our daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly, annually basis, to-dos with directions and deadlines are assigned to each person. Here's an example, about 38 of them that we usually build out. Um, but obviously, it's a lot more. But the idea is, let's say we had a full-time salesperson. His name is Dave. Dave would get a to-do in the morning with all his tasks, a detailed description of what he had to do. So maybe his job was to do all his estimates and make his sales follow-up calls. At about 5.30 in the afternoon, if Dave didn't do his job, the automation would either text message or email Dave at 5.30 saying, hey, Dave, you didn't do your job. This is what you should have done. And then based how important it is, escalates that process, notification to the manager or owner, and, and it pulls a human back in. So automation, the biggest misconception is they're there to replace people, but they're really there to replace the repetitive and tedious tasks that we hate doing or delegating that our office hates doing. And we create higher value jobs um, and positions in the business that have a bigger ROI. So the idea is if Dave didn't do his job, he's getting notified. And then the manager or owners get notified and they have to come in and manage that process. So we allow the power of service autopilot to manage the repetitive tasks, and when they don't happen, it pulls somebody in to manage it. So I know I went through the last part of this pretty quick because I've got a call, I've got to hop on here, but I do have about eight to 10 minutes to answer any of these questions live for anybody hanging out um, on this. And for a special um, thing that basically anybody who's still on here watching this recorded is that we have a two-day implementer event. Um, and I'm gonna put the link in here. Um, and use the option to, to get that, even if you can't attend it next Monday and Tuesday. Um, and with that, what I'm going to do is anybody who signed up or anybody who signs up here before the weekend, I'm going to give you our 36 video module with testing, um, a thousand dollar value included with the two day implementer event that comes with six months of video recording of it. Um, and then you get free access to that for a month. And after that, if you don't like it, you can cancel it. Otherwise, it would be an additional $39.97 for support and update of the training. But as V3 rolls out, we're continuing to add new videos that we've all built by Simple Group. Um, so everything in that original flow chart is going to be there broken down in subsequent two to three minute videos, streamlining the process to get someone in your office retrained or a new person up and running to the screens of success. So next week, 9th and 10th, Monday, Tuesday, myself and Simple Growth team are going to be breaking down eight hours a day, two days straight of each little piece that needs to be built out. We're going to actually show you how to build out Service Autopilot. In addition, we are going to be driving different topics such as automation, conversational marketing, life cycle marketing. So it's not going to be just all SA. These are going to be the transitional disruptors that are going to go in and be able to have you go into your market this year and disrupt your market. Um, we're also going to dive into Facebook Messenger, how we can drive that into SA with no double entry, trigger automations as well. So it's going to be action-packed March 9th and 10th. Um, I just put in the, um, the notes here of the two-day sign-up. Um, Dave says, now this is sexy. So we're looking forward to seeing you. But even if, we do, if you don't join us, hopefully this was helpful. Um, I've got a few more minutes here to answer any of these questions live or on record. I'm going to spend the next few minutes just kind of diving through the comments. Um, if you're here, let me know how long you've been using SA. Are you a simple growth client? Um, is there things I can answer for you here? So Dave, how do we set up SA estimates to know what our cost is based on our overhead cost? So Dave, great, 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 great question. I don't know exactly where you entered that in, but the SA blueprint or the simple growth blueprint that we build out is that answer. You can build that yourself, but the idea is create an Excel sheet or a Google sheet. In and create that in so you've got your one square foot to say 5,000 square feet, your base price. That's the lowest price we take to show up. And base it on your hourly goal, how much revenue you want per man hour, and your cost, your break even. And, and take that, and then those top five lines are going to translate to the top five lines in the SA um, matrix. And that will give you that. But if you go into the uh, website here, sa6deepdive.com, that is going to give you that cheat sheet free of charge. And if you need some more help, Dave, um, appreciate what you've been doing, brother. Join us for that two-day event, and for the cost of the admission, you're going to get 
our automated training with testing how to actually set this up um, basically free of charge. A huge value there. We want people to be successful in the spring season and go out and disrupt your market and dominate it. I uh, want to say what's up to Kyle Stevens, buddy. What is up, brother? So I got I to gotta give props where props are due. Uh, it was one faithful morning at, uh, it was it was John Deere Landscape at that point, but basically, um, or let's go. But uh, Kyle is a, a industry influence in upstate New York, highly respect him, lawn care, snow removal, design, build. And uh, Kyle was kind enough to take me under his wing, uh, probably in high school or college, and help show the ropes of the service industry. And uh, gentlemen like Kyle have been very influential in my success and support throughout the way. And um, very similar to Kyle taking a very uh, approach to abundance in his knowledge and sharing me and helping a young buck in the lawn care industry cutting his teeth. Um, I, I think it's my duty to continue to do exactly what Kyle did and provide that value in these free videos and answer these questions. So um, feel free to answer them. I know we're probably educating simple gross competition right now. I, I know we see a lot of them on these videos and, and they're taking some of the stuff that we teach and kind of repurposing as our own, but that's okay. If it's making everyone successful, it's good for the community. So once again, man, Kyle, if you're still watching, brother, appreciate what you've done for me. Uh, Scott, thinking of switching from LMN to SAP, that's why I'm watching videos like Scott, both software platforms are great, not talking uh, negative to um, either one of them. But if you are looking from LMN to SA, what we've actually been able to do, and you kind of see a sneak peek in that lawn mowing example, is what is an LMN can be rebuilt in SA. So drop me a private message if you want to just see real quick on a screen share what that looks like. But we can go in and break down uh, drive time, site prep, mobilization, maybe three gallon, uh, one gallon, two gallon uh, shrubs, the actual labor to install them, the product and materials, the warranty, all the information that you need in design and build can be broke down systematically. And then we usually marry an on site estimate form. So we go in and grab all the information subsequently. Um, so it drives the estimate process with no motion. So you go from your on site estimate form, it plugs in when you pull up the estimate template for leader client. It derives all the information. So you have a price, budget, time, and cost, and materials, uh, quantity, price, budgeted cost, and profit margin on those two. So that it's a systematic, non-emotional way um, there. <laughs> Young pup. Yes, a receding hairline here, Kyle. But, uh, buddy, we just get better with age. We're like a fine wine over here. Uh, it must be the, the Lake Ontario water. So got a few more minutes here before we wrap it up. Make sure you check it out, though. We've got the, uh, the two-day... Simple Growth Implementer event, 9th and 10. Um, if you join that up to the end, up to the end of the week here, we are going to give you free access to our automated uh, 36 videos and six modules of testing for your office staff. Uh, usually a thousand dollar fee that's going to be included with the two day remote streaming implementer event. So you can watch this from your office. You don't have to buy multiple seats. If you're in your office, each person who signs up is going to get one login. Um, so you can't share it with your buddy across the country, but if you have a one log in your office on a large TV or screen, uh, you and your team can huddle around it and watch it. And we're giving you up to six months of video recording access to that. So you can go through and use it as things slow down as well. And it looks like there may not be any more questions here, um, but any other questions, feel free to drop them in the recorded version. I actually have to hop off a call here with my team. Uh, believe it or not, Simple Growth Team is up to 10 team members right now. So we're, we're growing and scaling um, this ecosystem alongside Service Autopilot. So I'm actually flying out to SA uh, in a week and a half to, to work with their support and their development team and their marketing team. So as a certified advisor, we have a full force push to provide world-class service um, as a certified advisor. And I know SA is aligning with us to provide that service as well. So um whether you do it yourself, you need some help. We're here to answer those questions and be the, the knowledge center uh, for your lawn care, your home cleaning, pest control businesses, how to take a software, implement it correctly, standardize it to five or six screen success, and hopefully become the absentee owner and have that work-life balance. So once again, I want to thank everybody for hanging out. Thank Kyle, Scott, Dave Voynia, David Long. Um, and David Long had a quick question. How do we access the price range setup? I've never seen that before. That price blueprint there is at sa6deepdive.com. Hit that website, and uh, up to probably the end of the day Friday, I will leave that up um, so you can grab that as a thing. And up before Friday, if you do sign up for that uh, two-day implementer event, um, 
We're going to give you access to our 36 video bundle and six modules with testing and logic um, to automate your employee training and onboarding for service autopilot this spring um, as a bad benefit of attending that it's a live 16 hour event with recording options. So we'll see you there hopefully Monday and Tuesday of next week. I believe it's the 9th and 10th and I appreciate you joining me for the roadmap for success in service autopilot. And can't wait to SA sevens coming up sooner than later. Um, hopefully I will be on a stage near you at the conference 20, 2020, but, um, Man, if you haven't been to one of these conferences, well worth it. Uh, not only the knowledge, but the networking has been uh, instrumental in my growth in my businesses. So we'll see you there, um, hopefully Monday and Tuesday, for the two-day implementer event with myself, Chad, Dylan, Lori, and the rest of the Simple Growth team.